All right, so uh, I'm Matt Schutte. This is Unfiltered. At least that's the working title at this point. <laughs> I'm going to be talking today with Travis Wellman. Uh, I know Travis through the Build the Collaborative Internet Meetup. Travis, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm glad to be here. What are we going to be talking about today? Base paradigm, the next version of the Internet, all that good stuff? Yeah, how to, how to improve the Internet with graph data. Okay. That's, that's sort of what I'm about in terms of changing the world and in the realm of technology. So what's wrong with the internet today? <clears throat> um, to sum up, the, the, one of the cruxes of the problem is that um, we are depending on uh, a bunch of maintained services to be up. We're, we're building this whole network that's of, of references between data that, you know, in terms of URLs that entirely depends on a stability of very unstable uh, processes. That is, companies running servers and running programs to serve data in terms of, you know, their internal database and what they what they decide that should look like. And so you have this what what you have is this ecosystem where <clears throat> one entity, a company or a person, decides to just try to manage this kind of data, like bookmarking. Like, for instance, Delicious, which was really popular some time ago, right? Um, <clears throat> like, we're going to just do bookmarking on the Internet. And then, okay, they, that's great. They're really popular. Everybody gets on there. And because of this bandwagon-type, you know, trend, now... Everybody's doing bookmarking in terms of what Delicious uh, has, you know, the authors of Delicious have written, and that's great um, to the degree that it's great, right? But it's also not great to the degree that it doesn't fit some use cases because people have to, you know, because they're the one bookmarking site, people have to uh, ask them for improvements and so on. And it's basically all the downsides of closed source software. <clears throat> You're stuck because, you know, the software is running somewhere else. And so there's open source alternatives, and then you try to do federation, and, you know, you try to take over, and is it, it works to some degree. It doesn't work to some degree. Can you explain yeah. what federation is for the folks out there real quick? Right, so federation is where you have um, a bunch of servers that run mostly the same software and speak a common protocol, uh, and... Um, it can appear to the user that it's one service, but in reality, um, there's an ecosystem of people updating the functionality of that domain. So an example of this is XMPP, uh, StatusNet was one, which was in response to Twitter. Um, email is actually a really good example of federation, at least as I approach that definition. I'm sure other people give different definitions of what federation is. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so you have these responses to this sort of centralization of control that the internet is sort of built for, right? Um, and, and it works to some degree, but it also doesn't work to some degree. And so um, what base paradigm and graph data is about is trying to create a scheme for sharing data and um, creating networking type functionality that um, can't be dominated so easily. Once you publish it, then it's other people's to use and modify as they as they need to, as they want to. <clears throat> so. You could say this uh, decentralization aspect is 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 core. Like you, in in a world using base paradigm, it's impossible to um, to have a Facebook uh, because in order for Facebook to run, they have to give you the functionality to run Facebook, which they don't right now. They give you an API, right? They don't give you any functionality. Um, and so if they actually give you the functionality, then you can use it and not use it as you see fit. <clears throat> so, 
So I guess the, the immediate response that bubbles to my mind, and I'm sure is bubbling to others, is so what happens to copyright and intellectual property? And if I just put it out there, this sounds like the wild, wild west, right? I just put it out there, and, and now anybody can take my stuff and do whatever they want with it. Right, right. Well, I mean, nothing happens to intellectual property and copyright. I mean, it already happened with the Internet, right? People had these worries before um, that, you know, if you start publishing things and just letting anybody in a browser go and look at it and, you know, then you can copy it and reshare it. You can do a screen grab. You know, you can, you can do whatever you want. And people do do these things, um, <clears throat> but it still works. And so I don't think those, those are new questions. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, we've talked about this a lot, and my, my take on it has been um, that there are security layers that you can have there, and there are also sort of, and those can be built into the way that data is shared, but there are also other security layers uh, that you can have that have to do with um, ostracizing or cutting off people who Right. Violate your totally. cultural norms. Yeah, so so to some degree, it gives it doesn't make that situation worse. It gives actually better tools for managing um, copyright and uh, um, and consequences of breaking copyright. Um, yeah, that is, you can annotate any action. Bingo. And so because you can annotate any action, if you have shared a song file with me, and I wasn't supposed to copy that and share that with others, but I did copy it and share it with others, and you have somehow discovered that. You can annotate me. You can comment on me and point out to others that I'm a thief. And the next time I go to ask somebody to share a song with me, they look me up, and they see that I'm a thief. And they know, mm, maybe I don't want to share with that guy. And so it becomes the the pressure of not getting cut off in the future ends up being the mechanism that pushes me to not screw you over today. And the way that we've talked about this in the past is uh, that this is how things work in small communities. This is how things work in villages. Um, it hasn't worked up until now in larger communities because it's just too difficult for us to track reputation. It, costs too, it takes too much time. We don't have the mental capability to keep track of a billion people and their whole history. Um, but with the internet, that, that kind of changes a bit. With, with these new potential structures, that changes. Yeah. Or can so change. we'd say that you know, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Well, in, in a base paradigm internet, somebody could say that you're a dog, and then everybody would know. <laughs> if, they had, if they had said that in a way that they wanted everybody to have access to, right? They could also say these things and publish those statements in limited ways. So, like, I could comment about you, but only want people who are members of this group to be able to have access to that. And so, it's not, ex it's, there's a, one of the big worries that I think you and I both encounter when, pe when people get first introduced to these ideas is they go, so is this just going to be the surveillance state? Is everybody going to know everything? And just the opposite, right? The, the whole goal here is to give people really nuanced and fine-grained control over how broadly they are publishing information. Right, and have the defaults be conservative. Yeah. So, it can, but conservative as defined by them, right? P having their... Yeah, I mean, well, you would want when somebody first steps into the app not to suddenly be telling everybody what they're doing. They have to have a limited, you know, sandbox in which to discover what norms should look like. Um, and, and of course, you know, that's to a large degree just emergent because people have to learn that you're worth listening to. Mm -hmm. you know, they have to... You have your opinions have to be endorsed by other people that people already trust in order for people to ever consider listening to you if they don't already know you. <clears throat> so, uh, so I mean that's just life, right? It's it's a way to let people do on the internet what they already do in life in terms of identifying trustworthy sources of information and listening to what they say. Yeah, <clears throat> and having having nuanced 
control over what they find trustworthy, right? Like I might find you trustworthy in terms of knowledge of graph databases, distributed architectures, et cetera. I might not find you trustworthy in terms of restaurant recommendations in Bangkok. No. Yeah. I don't know anything about Bangkok. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and so when I'm looking up certain information, I would want these systems to route me towards you. When I'm looking up other things, I'd want them to route me away from you. Right. Um, yeah, so the, the, the tool with which people can easily set up those routing channels. Is that's right. What this paradigm is about. And, and then okay, so, so diving in, I mean, the, one of the things that when you talk about routing channels and we get into sort of signaling functions and most people who deal with anything related to this stuff almost inevitably come back to the whole analogy of how ants are intelligent as a group. Um, mm -hmm. They end up leaving little signals behind and mm -hmm. somebody, they kind of randomly go out, somebody finds something, they leave a signal, others stumble across that signal and go and when they, they confirm that they leave another signal and those trails build up and get stronger and stronger and and patterns emerge, solutions emerge from the swarm. And that's largely what we're trying to do in this stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. We're trying I mean, to build I, the infrastructure that enables people to leave those signals for one yeah, another. I can, I can pick apart the, the ant analogy, but yeah. it's, it's good enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool. Um, so... Let's dive in on the, you know, people go, wow, that sounds interesting in theory, but how do you actually do that? Oh, um, yeah, so Base Paradigm uh, describes um, a way to publish just about anything, any kind of data structure in terms of relationships between chunks of data. Um, and so in forming this sort of universal data structure that is about relationships between arbitrary data, just anything. Um, uh, you, can, you can have a medium with which to navigate all information, right, in terms of these tiny little documents. So, for example, I've got a, a comment that I've made on Facebook, and I've also rated this dish on Yelp, and somebody else had that dish that I had rated on Yelp was a, was a pad thai dish and somebody else has listed the ingredients that are in pad thai somewhere mm -hmm. else. Right, so being able just, to tie those things together. Yeah, you just mentioned like four or five different completely separate sources of information. <clears throat> the way the internet is structured right now, you'd have to go to four or five different sites and, you know, copy and paste and reference and, you know, have several tabs open in order to figure out you know, in order to relate them all in your mind so you could figure out an answer. <clears throat> With Base Paradigm, you would have, uh, as to use your term, a recipe, um, where you would be like, I want to make this kind of decision, and you would find, you would find through some kind of search engine or index that recipe that um, has been published by somebody that you trust or that is default trustworthy. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and then you would query using that recipe that would download from multiple sources. And those sources may not be actual physical sources, which is another big difference. They may have all published to um, uh, one central repository that you know of. That, you know, say the Internet Archive, right? Just someplace with a bunch of hard disk space. Um, you know, and it could be your own local server if you want. Um, just anything that you've let other people know is a place to put data. They can put their data. Uh, and they put their digital signature on it, so you know it's from them. Um, and they put their schema on it, so you know it's this kind of data. Um, and then they, <clears throat> they build the structure using these tiny little documents that we mentioned called edges. Um, and when you use the recipe, you download all this information from all these different sources at once um, and locally on your own computer uh, or on some compute that you trust, uh, you relate it together and you find an answer. So you basically, to kind of 
make this bat visual for the folks at home. You've got content over here, you've got content over here, you've got content over here. Somebody has written recipes tying these things together, or they've written pieces relating one thing to another, relating this thing to that thing. So you can think of those as there's a little graph here with some relationships, there's another graph over here with some relationships, there's another graph over here. Somebody else has made comments tying these graphs together. Somebody else has said, hey, traverse, and pu pulling these separate smaller graphs into take them and pull them into this place and assemble them together to make one bigger graph. And then somebody has said, okay, great. Now using that big graph with all these little entities and the relationships between them all connecting a bunch of stuff together, run across it like this. Go from here and then look up this piece and grab that and then go from there and go look up this piece and grab that and traverse and navigate across this thing and pull down the information. Yeah. Um, mm. Cool. So there's distributed graphs. There's like a graph on my computer, a graph on your computer, stuff that's not a graph, things that are just content but that somebody else has related, made a graph, described a relationship between that piece of non-graph content and something else. Um, actually, could you comment just very quickly on that, on, the, on what is so wonderful about graphs in terms of their, their flexibility and what they can handle? Sure. Well, um, they're great in that they're um, they're less restrictive than common other forms of structuring data, like relational databases. Um, <clears throat> they're uh, more efficiently traversed than other kinds of structure, like document-oriented databases. Um, and basically, they're 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 equal to those other schemes in terms of um, ability to abstract uh, and represent just any kind of information, um, and uh, and the cool thing about base paradigm graphs is that every edge uh, can be wrapped up in its own document, and so you can pretend like you have access to the entire internet um, with just a small subset of it because you have references off that are easily resolved. <clears throat> and so, so when you need, when you need more, then you just ask for it and you know that you're getting exactly what you should be getting no matter where it comes from. To try to unpack that a little bit, mm -hmm. you mentioned that an edge can be wrapped up in its own document. Now, what is an edge? And what do you mean by it can be wrapped up in its own document? An edge is the um, fundamental building block of a graph. It relates to nodes, and a node can be anything. So a node can be a picture of my face, it can be a text document, it can be a Word document, a PDF, or a URL. <clears throat> so you've got an entity, or two nodes. Mm -hmm. let's, let's say um, me as an individual, my first name, Matthew. So Matthew, me. And there's a relationship between these, which is like first name. Could that be an example? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So if I if I already have a node that represents to me your identity, and you know that it represents to me your identity, and I want to know your first name, then I would use a recipe like we were just talking about, which would find um, <clears throat> a relationship between your identity and something else, which I don't know yet. That, that labels you as having a first name, and that would be the edge that you were just talking about. So when you take that edge, which is basically this relationship between two nodes, two or more nodes, or, or should it always be two nodes? Two or more, yeah. But right. we, I mean, that makes things complex, so we can talk <laughs> about that later. <laughs> um, when you say that you wrap that up into it, its own document, what does that mean? Um it means that you can separate that edge from the graph in which it was uh, originally authored. Great. So you can, you can slice off pieces so people are not having to deal with the entire worldview of the, of the original author. They can carve out small chunks and that, make, that makes it more modular and they can thus recompose things. Yeah. remix stuff much more easily. Yeah, yeah, and it gives you freedom to explore only what you need to know 
Um, and it's mostly at a technical level, it just makes it possible because otherwise, if you're downloading the entire, you know, knowledge base of <laughs> companies, you know, it just doesn't work. <laughs> It'd be really, really slow. Um, I've got a question, actually. So much of this has been, like, me playing dumb, right, to try to clarify, get stuff out and sort of explain. Um, but I actually have a question that, that is uh, less pretending to be dumb and more just being dumb. Um, how do we... Not, we've talked about some of this stuff a lot, but how do we make these massive graphs and the many massive graphs, how do we make that efficiently navigable? What, 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 I've, I've heard problems in the past from other graph database companies that once graphs get to a certain size, they become unwieldy. Um, thoughts on that? Um, indexes, for the most part. Um, you know, sometimes, like, what, what happens when things stop scaling is usually that your existing uh, storage mechanism is too small and your indexes are too precise. And so you need, you need a higher level index. You need to somehow break things up at a, at a larger level that, um, uh, that will give you, you know, a, dec a decision to make before you find before you actually find your data. And this is this is at a technical level, right? Like the, the decision is the software figuring out where to look um, so that it can find it quickly. And so basically you need an, you need an index of indexes, for instance. Uh, and a lot of this occurs um, as an emergent way that, you know, people self-organize their, their servers and architectures in order to simply make their data accessible. Um, because if you want to publish something and you want to build functionality around publishing it, you have, people have to be able to get it, right? So you, you stick something somewhere out there and you say, can you get it? And if you can't, then you have to do something different, right? And so, you know, maybe you need another server, maybe you need an intermediary service or metadata or, you know, there's it's too big a question to have a simple answer for. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, it's something that is solved as a matter of um, people building out functionality. Uh, it's, it's out of scope in terms of um, simply how the technology works as we're describing it right now. Great. Yeah, and, and I'm not going to dive too far into it, but there's related work uh, that another guy who intends to build the collaborative internet meetup, Garth Johnson, is doing. It's focused on basically trying to enable people to sell their computer storage and processing time and maybe at some point bandwidth. Um, the goal with that being very efficient use of resources, but also in my mind the goal being that when you're running a search, you have an incentive, if you're actually having to pay for that search to be run, you have an incentive to search for the more elegant solution. And that makes your community as a whole route towards efficient or elegant solutions, or to restrict the amount of uh, consumption, right? If they, if they don't need something at a super fine, detailed level, that it'd be good enough to have, you know, to know the temperature within two degrees. They don't need to know it within one-tenth of a degree. Um, and they don't need to know it live. They need just to know like what was the most recent update. Um, yeah, using using market dynamics, you know, to to manage the sort of scarcity of the system and get people what they want according to what they're willing to, you know, according to the cost that they're able to pay. You know, in terms of whatever, in terms of electricity or uh, reputation credits or whatever is 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 important work. Yes. And I think you and I, we've talked about this a lot, and I'd love to dive into it at another point, but I don't think we're going to have time this time. But another, for a topic for another day is uh, scarcity-based economics and how we won't ever get past that, and that's a good thing. Uh, I thought we were going to get past it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um... Again, topic for another day. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
Okay, so so dealing with with base paradigm, um, you know, I've talked about this a fair bit. I've got I'm um, make relating one thing with another thing in my own little graph. I publish that to the world by publishing it to an index or to indexes. And again, those those cultural norms and approaches will evolve over time themselves. But we're trying to map out like the basic structure for that. Um, Base paradigm and spaciousness, like, what's the relationship between those two? All right, so we've been talking about base paradigm. Spaciousness is um, a high-level interface into base paradigm, right? So base paradigm is a data structure. It's like your file system, right? You don't really ever look at it. What you look at is your file browser. So uh, um, on Mac OS, it's called Finder. On you know GNOME Linux is called uh, Nautilus. Uh, what is it called on Windows? I don't even know. I don't know. Explorer. Or <laughs> yeah, Explorer. That's right. That. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and so that gives you you know icons and windows and stuff. And so spaciousness is that for base paradigm. It's like a file system for the internet, except for it's nothing like a file system. You know, it's <laughs> it's exactly like that, except it's nothing like that. <laughs> it plays an analogous role. Yeah, yeah. It's it's where you go back to all the time in order to get and put data. Uh, and it it has a ton more functionality in terms of executing stuff and showing you relationships, uh, being pluggable, um, and it's it's kind of like you know, if you think, like, where's where's all my data? If I want to find out, you know, if I want to do something new, if I want to, like, find all of the emails to people that I've emailed in the last week, um, all of your data should be on your, you know, all of that data, all of your email data should be local, and, <clears throat> and you should be able to go into spaciousness and uh, figure that out because it's, it's the abstract tool with which you can do anything. And, and when you say local, you mean accessible, basically, yeah? Not physically on your right. computer that's in your hand. So uh, it could no, be. It could it be. It could be. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying it, it is essentially local, right? It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be. It's, it's wherever you put your data. Um, that is the data that you need to be accessible. And so um, it's not remote in the sense that it's not somewhere where you're not sure you can get at it, right? <clears throat> so it's it could be physically remote. It could be stored anywhere in an in a networked world, but stored in places where you have access to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's and your experience of that it's not going to matter. It's similar to the cloud today, right? It doesn't matter to you where it's physically stored. All that you care about is that you're able to pull it up. Yeah, it's stuff that you keep, and it's it's personal to you. And so, so that is, yeah, that's that's what local is going to start meaning more and more. Great. Mm. Um, what time are we at? Oops. We are getting close. We've got a. Uh, about another minute or so before we want to do our wrap up. Um, why? What 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 brought you to do this? Yeah. Um, well, there's there's lots of different reasons. Um, I, you know, siloization um, is bad. Uh, being stuck with you know, Facebook for social networking, for instance, um, being stuck with Google for search, uh, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to have um, something that you have to be able to be to do, like every day, that is search the web. It doesn't make sense to have that functionality somewhere where you don't control it. You know, and to have using that functionality on a daily basis, which you have to do in order to live your life, um, 
the process of using that functionality, constantly giving information to other people that, you know, may not have your best interests in mind. And, you know, it's just this loss of control that everybody in the world is experiencing. Um, and uh, it's vivid to me how uh, unnecessary this architecture is. It seems obvious to me that we can build it differently um, and uh, we don't have to build in these assumptions of remote services um, and, uh, and that it would work to have uh, to, for people to publish the functionality in terms of uh, graph data, in terms of edges that can be distributed, that can be stored locally and backed up and owned. Um, that the entire internet can be um, a large distributed data structure instead of um, a fragile distributed network of services. Awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, we talk through this stuff a lot, and uh, I'm going to sort of summarize moving away from the technical terms and moving back towards more traditional political terms. The world works better when individuals are empowered. The current structure disempowers individuals because it makes it so that, like you said, they're having to trade away information, attention, etc., in order to get access to basic functionality. Um, and there's a, there's a different way that that could be structured, and that's what you're trying to build. That's what we're trying to build. Yeah. So let's do a little wrap-up. Um, <laughs> Three-minute wrap-up. Do you think we're going to be able to pull off a summary of what we covered in three minutes? We can try. So, um, let's start with the highlight. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'm going to leave this to you. All right. Um, so, uh, so base paradigm is the way that I'm trying to make a difference in the world, technologically speaking. Um, and uh, it is um, a large distributed data structure, uh, which uh, empowers individuals um, and makes it possible for you to do the things that you need to do every day. Um, without giving away more than, well, without giving away anything, really. Um, because you shouldn't have to. Uh, you shouldn't have to click through terms of service and, you know, uh, and, and use, you know, spotty, you know, questionable uh, um, connectivity options in order to just, you know, do your daily work. Um, and, and we do that by uh, publishing uh, relationships between uh, arbitrary data, uh, that is anything, pictures, words, um, uh, sound files, anything, and um, relating them in small documents uh, that can be pushed around and stored um, anywhere. Um, that retain the authorship of the original publisher, uh, that retain uh, their schema that, that links them to the rest of the graph that they belong to, um, and that, uh, that can be navigated one by one without um, losing context uh, so that all you really need is a, a small collection of these documents in order to be able to find all of the rest of the things on the internet. <clears throat> uh, and this is, this is the way that I see to um, make the, the internet a safer place to uh, navigate and, um, and uh, build out services in the future that, uh, that don't, don't hurt the users, don't provide this slippery slope for users to lose control. Perfect. Travis, thank you so much, sir. Uh, we'll have to definitely continue this conversation. We'd love to do some more interviews on uh, with you on meta currency or semantic currency, um, as well as on a few of the other points that we had we had touched on today. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. Great. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh,